Sunday to spend it here with us. Grief, loss and bereavement is a very emotive topic. And I don't know about you, but I find Sundays quite solemn. My dad used to play jazz music every day of the week. Saturdays, that was his day for jazz, but Sundays was classical music. And for some reason, it's the day that I miss him the most. It's the day my heart weeps the most. There's something about Sundays for me that makes grief quite sensitive, but then again, grief is incredibly complex. So why are we here? In the early days of the pandemic, we all saw the news about the stories, the statistics, got that tongue tied, and the speculation about the disproportionate numbers of Black, Asian, and minoritized ethnic people who were dying from COVID. And in our communities, we were hearing the stories of families not being able to grieve in the way that they want to, not being able to perform memorials and rituals in the way that we are accustomed to. And it really came home to me when Dame Jocelyn Barrow died in April. And for those who don't know, she was actually the first black woman to be a governor of the BBC. And she was actually also the founder of the Broadcasting Standards Council. Well, apart from what seemed to be a silence around her death, that's a different topic for a different time, but people were, texting and phoning to confirm whether or not she had actually passed. And one of the reasons was there was no notice out there about her funeral. And it, it was quite distressing. I mean, I attended her 90th birthday party as I know some of the people in this um, conversation attended. So her passing was one, a surprise, but two, the silence around it was a bit shocking. And the fact that we weren't allowed to attend a funeral and give her what she deserved as someone who was so fundamental in the issues around being black, being female in not only just the BBC, but in English society. We attended her online funeral. There were five people, quite incredibly distressing. Then we lost a pioneer from the Notting Hill Carnival. And I don't know if you're familiar with funerals within the Notting Hill Carnival fraternity. They started the tabernacle and they weave their way through Notting Hill. We are all facing tough times, but for those who have lost a loved one, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. So when we saw what was happening, we decided to come together and BAME Stream was formed out of that. So I don't know if any of you, well, I know some of you did attend the launch on Thursday, but for those who don't, BAME Stream is really a collective, an alliance of Black, Asian and minoritized practitioners, therapists, policy experts, activists and academics. And we've all come together to work in the area of mental health and that includes grief, loss and bereavement. It's led by Patrick Vernard, Helen George, who sends her apologies and myself. Grief, loss and bereavement is, it, I'll say again, it is very emotive, but there's no one size fits all way of dealing with it. So we're here today and I know we're gonna hear so many stories and exchanges about the different cultural variations where that's concerned. So to kick off the discussion, we have three members from Barton. We've got Dr. Aisha, we've got Eugene, and we've got Dennis. Please, welcome, welcome. Please can I ask you three to unmute yourselves and start our conversation. Tell us about intercultural and intergenerational grief. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, hello, I'm really honored uh, to join you here this evening for this event. My name is Eugene Ellis, I'm the director and founder of the Black African and Asian Therapy Network or Barton. Um, so Barton's a service that hopes to address uh, the inequality of access to appropriate psychological services um, for Black, African, South Asian and Caribbean heritage people. Uh, focus is really is on supporting therapists into their training and mentoring them and to try to influence the mainstream therapy profession through literature and training and practice. Uh, we also have an online directory of almost 500 therapists from those communities. 
I'm here with Dennis Carney and uh, Aisha Mackenzie Mavinga, two of our uh, leadership members. And um, Aisha will be saying a little bit about intersectional context of grief and loss. Uh, Dennis will be saying a little bit about HIV, COVID-19, grief and me. Uh, and he will have a personal, personal story and a personal journey there. And I'll also be reflecting on a personal journey and uh, the thing that I'm going to be talking about is a cry of the ancestors. Um, so the three of us will remain on screen and we're going to see if you, see if you can be interactive between us. Um, um, so to support each other uh, in some ways um, and also hopefully to make it a little more interactive for those watching. Um, at the end of our reflections, we want to open up uh, to your reflections and thoughts from the from those who are watching and uh, we'll let you know you know when to put something in the chat and then we'll kind of read what you say and we'll reflect on your reflections of our reflections <laughs> and of course your <laughs> own reflections. Um, so I'm a psychotherapist and uh, soon to be author I've got a book coming out with a race conversation soon um, but I want to get Dennis and Aisha just to say a little bit about themselves um, before we kind of start the presentation. So maybe Aisha, do you want to just say a little bit about yourself? Yes, hello everyone. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm a psychotherapist. Hello, Alex. Yeah, I'm a psychotherapist and counselor and a lecturer and also a writer. And I've published uh, two books emanating from my doctoral thesis and those books came out of a study of the impact of racism on the psychology of black peoples. Um, and this is the main theme of my work these days, just really thinking about how to engage with the mind of black peoples and Asian peoples who have been impacted by racism and, and how that affects their relationships and their psychological processes. That's all I say for now. Okay. And Dennis, just want to say a bit about yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. Hi, uh, I'm Dennis. Uh, I've been a member of the Barton leadership team for about 10 years. I did my training in humanistic psychotherapy for 12 years at an organization called Spectrum. Uh, some people might know me as a black LGBT activist. I don't really like that label, but some people put that onto me. Um, and I primarily work with groups. Um, I teach at uh, the City Lit in Covent Garden. And I've been working there for about 15 years. And uh, I worked for a mental health charity, an LGBT mental health charity for about 15 years called Pace. Uh, yeah. And I haven't written a book. <laughs> Uh, um, I'm sure it's. I'm, I'm sure it's not going to be too long before you do, Dennis. Um, <laughs> okay, so maybe start off. With, we'll start off with Aisha, and then Dennis will start, and um, will say something, and then I will. But so Aisha, going to be talking about the intersectional context of grief and loss. Oh, first of all, I'd like to say a thanks to the organisers for inviting us to contribute to this webinar. Really important webinar. And um, also to say that after agreeing to take part in this event, I felt reluctant because it can be difficult to have this important dialogue about our grief without opening up a can of worms. And I'm very aware that my colleagues, uh, Eugene and Dennis were feeling similar. In a short space of time, there's not much room for emotions, but we're gonna present what we can. We've suffered personal and collective grief, and as therapists, we've had to put our own grief aside while supporting others who are grieving. First, I want to offer my condolences to those who've lost loved ones through illness, through tragedy, and because of COVID-19 virus. At this time, I also want to remember and offer condolences to the families of those lives lost in the mental health system because this is a really important area of the work we do. Those lost in, in who's lost, lost their lives in the penal system and those families who have suffered tragic loss due to police violence and slaughter 
of our loved ones. And also my condolences to those connected to key members of our therapeutic community as black and Asian people. And this year we lost two really important black men, um, Lennox Thomas and Arike Grant, who contributed greatly to transcultural and black psychotherapy and counseling. A mixture of sadness and loss, whilst at the same time, celebration of another life is important and gives us a sense of who we are as humans. This is what gives us a sense of connection. In our work as African Caribbean and Asian therapists, we also bear witness to several layers of evidence in our grieving processes. Our mental health can suffer from these layers of grief and loss. And the challenges of saying goodbye to loved ones in a community that suffers the consequences of social distance, emotional distance, geographical distance, often compounded by intergenerational and intercultural costs and oppressions that can set us apart. It's usually a, it's a huge challenge not to be in each other's arms when we're grieving. And I want to briefly outline factors that can interfere and compound our connections when we've lost loved ones. On a personal level, my own children were challenged by the passing of their father who lived in Jamaica. The restrictions of closed national boundaries and diverse customs created multiple layers of grieving and loss and but not being able to say a final unrestricted goodbye within their Caribbean family seemed to compound their grief. In addition, a live memorial to mark his departure had been arranged in the UK and then lockdown happened. So we've been going through this for months. The impact on family traditions and customs is, is huge due to the pandemic and this goes deeper than just numbers attending services and burials. Gathering of community and the village at African, Caribbean and Asian burials and memorials is generally a norm in our places already. And for our descendants in the UK. The tradition of nine nights and awake that incorporates food, blessings, music, and fond memories, meaningful to a final goodbye, have been quashed or regulated to or relegated, sorry, to a screen. Graveside rituals such as honoring ancestors, drumming, placing palm leaves, singing and wailing have been quashed due to attendance and restrictions on the COVID battlefield. Being allowed to attend a funeral, but not allowed to sing, shuts down the grieving process of self-expression. And this is only workable for individuals who are assimilated and have become used to silent tears. And I've also heard that uh, racism exists in funeral parlors where, uh, I see some heads nodding here, where black um, ministers are not being given work. I won't um, extend that at the moment, but I heard this from a very close friend who's an interfaith minister. We are also aware of the intersectional impact of oppressions, in particular racism. It's very difficult to talk about racism in a group like this without talking about racism, and that's our work. That's our work as therapists at Barton. The enduring impact of racism that many people of colour experience can play, can also play a role in rifts within family groups and in the self-esteem of individuals. The emotional context of learning not to cry out loud has inhibited, inhibited many. Due to don't discharge messages and also social stereotypes, that cause internalization of real feelings. And this is in addition to being in a chapel and being told that you can't sing, therefore you can't wail, and you can't scream. In addition, these feelings are compounded by a sense of multi-layered silencing, adding to heartbreak, as mourners are able to attend a funeral 
but not express themselves loudly inside the chapel. This can curb the colorful dress and camaraderie that have been cultural ways of identifying within our communities. The impact of racism on our health can make breathing seem like a luxury sometimes. The full-blown impact of racism and other forms of violence echoes heavily in our hearts, our minds, bodies, and our actions. Needless to say, the health, the health, um, the problems with our health that we suffer as a result of trying to, to survive in this community. Cultural conflicts about ways of grieving can impact on identity and self-worth and bury feelings of anger and guilt. And we've heard repeatedly about these feelings in, in our therapeutic sessions with individuals who've experienced loss. The grandmother of deceased Colton Bushy told the New York Times, even to this day, I hold back on crying. I pray the way I was taught in the residential school, our father, Hail Mary and all that, she said. And then in other ways, I believe that my granny, I, I believe what my granny believes both ways, and sometimes I think about it. Which one is true? The Catholic way, Catholic way or my granny? So I just go on both sides. So you can see how this plays with the mind. Miss Denny was sent to two schools run by the Roman Catholic Church. She said that when she was beaten with a leather strap by the school's nuns and priests, she made a vow. I wasn't going to give them what they wanted to hear me crying. I just held it back. And even to this day, I'm like that. I hold back on crying. It kind of hurts me, you know. And so this familiar, what I call don't discharge messages often occur in the work that we do. Uh, and so there's the inner stopping of the expression of grief, but there's also the impact of racism and the stereotypes that often we fear as a result of fully expressing ourselves and our grief. This is familiar, this is a familiar mode of containing oneself amidst the pain of oppression and past hurts reinforced by belief systems, family traditions, and in opposition to customs of loud expression and loss of loss and grief. After each loss, our identities and self-understanding become transformed and generally we get an opportunity to rethink our lives and reassess our responses to oppression and consider the joy of connection and reunion and ways of moving our lives on. But for the present, we are limited in our ways of grieving and bound to be creative with what we have and we still have each other. That's all I'm going to say for now. And uh, yeah, no, nice. So much there, Aisha. So much there. You know, yeah, it's wow. a, a lot packed into a small. A lot packed in there, yeah. Mm. And just um, yeah, I'm just feeling really sad um, hearing all of that all together. And yeah, just reflecting on the work that we do and in Barton and how. Um, how you know, certainly I feel it in my body a lot, you know, and I'm feeling it now. That sort of weighing down, that holding in, that non-expression, trying to counteract it in some way. Yeah, thank you, Aisha. Yeah, it's just so multi-layered. Yeah, yeah. But when we come together in community, we can even in even yeah. if it's in a small way, we can we can move some way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think Dennis now is going to give us a personal story um, and um, yeah, HIV, COVID, grief and me. Hi, good, good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. Yeah, so uh, many thanks for sharing your openness, honesty and wisdom with us, Aisha. Uh, I really, really appreciate what you shared. Um, 
So my name is Dennis and I've been a member of the Barton leadership team for the last 10 years or so. Um, and like Aisha said and mentioned, um, in preparation for this conversation, I noticed I had some reluctance to talk about my grief and my personal journey. And I guess, you know, I imagine for a wide variety of reasons, I'm not alone here, especially if your parents told you never to put your business at bra. You know, so the idea of coming here and, and sharing openly about uh, some of my experiences really did set some reluctance in me. Um, but I'm here and I'm here to, to share. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I think the first thing I want to say is I wouldn't describe myself as an expert on bereavement, far from it. Yes, I've done some training around this and I've worked with clients around loss and bereavement, but I certainly wouldn't describe myself as an expert. Um, during this conversation, I share some of my own personal experiences. Um, as a black gay man, I've had a lot of personal experience of death and bereavement, especially during the early days of the HIV epidemic. Um, and I think that's also true of the COVID pandemic. I think as a black person, I definitely have experienced loss and bereavement in, I think, much higher levels than, let's say, the general population here. Um, during my mid-twenties, I worked for an HIV charity that provided accommodation for people living with HIV and AIDS. And I worked there for 10 years. And for the whole 10 years that I was there, Nobody ever asked me, oh, Dennis, uh, do you think it would be helpful to have some bereavement counseling? Um, in fact, we, we were expected as staff just to get on with it. We had clients dying on a weekly basis, yet there was nowhere for us to talk about that. Um, and like I say, we were just expected to get on with it. At the same time as working for that organization, I was dealing with the traumatic loss of many gay friends who died from HIV. My first boyfriend died from AIDS. Um, I had a subsequent boyfriend who was diagnosed with HIV. I was at the bedside of one of a very close friend uh, when he died. Um, and yeah, you know, the impact of that has been quite heavy on me when I think about it. And at the time, there were very, very few places to talk about it because of the level of stigma, discrimination, hatred, fear that surrounded AIDS. I can remember going to funerals where people wouldn't even mention uh, the cause of death. In fact, they'd often say that the person died of cancer and not AIDS. Um, I would remember people not acknowledging the sexuality of the person who died uh, because of shame and stigma around homosexuality in our communities and the kind of pain, certainly the pain that caused me in terms of, the, you know, the kind of uh, the invisibility, I guess, of uh, their lives and their contributions in, in, while they were here. Um, I think when I think about uh, HIV and I think about the pandemic and I think about now, one of the things that struck me is how much little has changed in terms of uh, provision of support um, and help and guidance around, around grief and bereavement. Um, and when I think about the fact that, you know, who would I go and talk to? if I can't talk to my family members around death and loss, who's gonna actually listen? You know, I think often people feel really uncomfortable talking about death, loss, and I think, and that's obvious. I mean, I think it's a very taboo subject, not just in our communities, but I think worldwide. Um, and when I think about today, and when I think about COVID, you know, again, as a black, as a black man, I think I've lost uh, quite a significant number of people in my life due to COVID, 
I'm currently dealing with the loss of a family member who died two weeks ago, suddenly. I'm also dealing with the death of a very treasured and valued member of the leadership team, Ari Kay. Um, so yeah, over the last nine months, I've been dealing with a lot of grief. And I think one of the things that uh, I think Aisha mentioned was the fact that most people are not able to attend funerals and interact and deal with grief in the way that we would normally do. And when I think about the number of funerals that have happened over the last nine months, I've only been able to attend one funeral. And that funeral was via the computer. Now, if I'm being really honest, I think the, the idea of attending the funeral online was a bit of a relief because I think I've attended so many funerals over the years. Um, in fact, I remember thinking, oh, am I going to go to this funeral? And, and then I thought, do I really want to go? And then I thought, actually, the fact that it's online enables me to be there in a way that I couldn't be there. I thought, yeah. And I have to say, having that screen there was really helpful. You know, what Asha was saying about hiding our pain, hiding our tears, hiding behind that screen enabled me to do that in a way that I don't think I would have been able to do if I was in a room full of people. So whilst I know Zoom gets a lot of uh, bad press, I think for me on that occasion, I found it a really helpful way to grieve and grieve in a way that was meaningful to me. Um, so yeah, so uh, I just wanted to throw that in because I think that's a, a perspective that's often not acknowledged. Um, I think one of the things that I noticed, especially around HIV, was that um, there was a huge amount of silence. Nobody talked about it. And I think the other thing that I realized that's very similar to today is that you know, black and brown people were expected to be resilient around it. You know, we were just expected to get on with it. Um, and I think the same is true when I think about COVID. You know, I, I think uh, the same is true again. Um, I think, you know, dealing with grief during lockdown has been particularly challenging and difficult. Um, as I think Aisha mentioned, um, the inability to hug and touch in a way that uh, is very, very important for me in terms of my grieving process. The absence of that has been really, really challenging for me on a personal level. Um, not being able to be with family right now um, is also really, really, really hard. Um, my sister's just gone through the loss of her partner and I can't be there for her. I can't hug her, I can't hold her in a way that I know I want to. Um, I can't attend the funeral because uh, there are restrictions on the numbers of people who are there. The funeral is going to be next Thursday. I want to be there with my sister. I can't be there for my sister. That pains me. Um, yeah, and you know, I, was, I was actually uh, anxious about even mentioning that today because I thought, well, uh, do people really want to sit here and listen to me bawl in, in tears and wail? Um, is this what this space is about? Um, and I just, I really want to thank the fact that there are all these black and brown faces watching me and listening to me share because I think these spaces are so rare in, in my experience. And so I just want to thank BMA Screen for putting this on um, and making a space available where black and brown people can talk about these things. We think it's important to talk. But one thing that um, I'm left with when I think about all of this, I'm reminded of a famous quote by Maya Angelou. And she, I remember her saying that this too shall pass. And I think it's true, the difficult times that we're going through right now in our communities will pass and better days are ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. You um, hear that saying so often in the Caribbean, this too shall pass. Um, it's, it's comforting, but 
it doesn't help immediately. And, um, and I also, but I also feel it's a, a really useful saying, a cultural saying that gets banded about. Um, thank you for also considering an alternative, alternative perspective to using, being forced to use the screen for grieving, you know, because often we don't think about what, what can be the benefits, if, if anything, you know, and, um, and sharing your perspective on that is quite important. Um, also that you're a black gay man talking about your experience. And I want to thank you for that too. Um, and while you were talking, I was thinking about how often, and I hear this mainly in the Caribbean, young black men in particular will commit suicide rather than come out to their families. Um, and that's not spoken about much. Not at all. Sad and heartbreaking situation of a loss and a grief that is also silenced because, yeah. because of homophobia. Yeah. Uh, and um, so I think it's really important that we do speak these things um, and particularly about HIV. You know, I have, a, I have a gay friend who I've known for years, um, but it was still years before he told me he, he was HIV positive. And, um, and so what? Yeah. You know, so I think it's really important for us to name these things and be able to talk about them and to grieve over the specific areas of oppression and um, connection that we lose because we don't talk about these things. Um, yeah. yeah. And thank you, Aisha. And you know, even a, a friend of mine came out to me recently, and he was diagnosed over twenty years ago. And he knows that I have only <clears throat> worked in the field for decades, uh, and still felt reluctant to to disclose that information to me. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Dennis. Your voice is very important to Barton and uh, to me. Okay, I'm going to um, do my bit. I'm just going to sort of dedicate this to Eric Ari Kay, who who, um, who we lost, um, and I'm still feeling the loss of him. Um, so I'll be sort of doing a, a personal story. So I'm going to be looking at um, grief and loss of my father uh, through the lens of intergenerational trauma. Um, and this wasn't a, a recent loss. It wasn't due to COVID. Um, but I, I wanted to reflect on grieving when the person that you're grieving is the person that's also hurt you, um, either physically or emotionally or both. Um, and people, and different people have different ways of grieving in situations like this. And I suspect that uh, there may be a few people in the audience who've been faced with this themselves. Um, you know, yeah. So how do you grieve? How do you grieve that? Um, so this is just what my one story, really. Um, so, so I want to say a little bit about trauma itself, and then I want to tell you about my father and then read a piece of creative writing um, that I've entitled The Cry of the Ancestors that uh, expresses where I am now with his loss uh, as a father and the relationship that we had. Um, like for many of us, trauma shaped our lives and our inner, our inner lives, um, just as Aisha was saying, the holding back. Um, of grief, of anger. Um, intergenerational trauma was the context in which our relationship had been shaped uh, and that intergenerational trauma had been passed on to me. My father died a while ago in August 2004 from pneumonia um, after suffering a stroke. And he was living in Jamaica at the time with my mother. Um, so as a family, there were seven of us, we. We went over to attend the funeral. We could in those at that time. And as we were there, there were many stories of his skill as a craftsman, his generosity towards the local community and how, where he lived. Um, 
and he was very generous. Um, he could do no wrong. But uh, where there are stories of outside the home, there's also the silent stories of inside the home whilst in the UK. He was clearly a different person now. Um, he'd been there for, been went back to Jamaica and had been there for about 15 years or so. But the silence of the past um, kind of still created a, a sort of disconnection and I couldn't really grieve. Um, as well as um, expelling frustration uh, while he was in the UK, my father's um, used to beat us as we all got beaten. Um, that was uh, what, what happened. Um, but these beatings were, in my mind, a, a sort of generational old strategy to ensure that a repressed, um, that, that I repressed any notions of rebellion and that kept me out of arm's way. Um, and he perceived a real danger as being outside of the home. And he wanted to keep me out of harm's way. Um, but my father's beatings had shaped my experience of fear. So fear was seeped into my, into my body uh, and sort of impacted um, almost every aspect of my life. Um, being in therapy with a black man was where for the first time I'd really looked at my relationship with him in any meaningful way. And I think being with a black man um, kind of just allowed something to happen which couldn't happen in another, in another, with another, with another person. Um, so along with the therapy, um, I've done a process of writing and I've been doing lots of writing for many years. This allowed me to talk about him in a way that did not rub us of the history and context of what shaped us. Um, I can speak about him now, but I don't think I can speak without speak about him without reference to our history and our ancestors. And I felt it would not uh, be being possible to communicate the hurt of our relationship and also bring compassion, forgiveness, and understanding to the moment of ancestral time that my father and I found ourselves in when I was a child. I wrote this piece while I was on a retreat and um, reflecting both on, on the ancestors I knew um, in my past and the ancestors that I didn't know. And as I was reflecting, um, I just put together these words and it came, to, it came together really, really quickly. Uh, normally I have to spend a lot of time on these things, but it literally I just sat down under a tree and it just came out. So this is called The Cry of the Ancestors, so I'll, I'll read it out. Black, naked, bound and broken, a crushed heart inside a broken soul. Sons and daughters bear witness, this was once a man. Black, naked, fearful and fertile, White faces bright with eyes of lust for a mixing of the blood. Sons and daughters bear witness. This was once a woman. Hardy limbs, black and plentiful, claim unspeakable horrors, more beast than human. Sons and daughters bear witness. This was once a people. Daddy, this is our legacy. But what of us playing our part in this dance from the past, with no balm to soothe the corners of the mind which lock away that loveless dread, that which is our inheritance? With your muscle and sinew giving up a little of the mind's secret as they smash and grind and silently scream with only my small child's cry of fear and bewildered confusion as a mirror into a time one should have long forgot. But it's enough. It's enough to ensure that this corner of the world's suffering does not go unnoticed. For many years of unlocking the unsayable, I want you to know that I've heard you. I've heard your plea. I know that you have journeyed through this system they call race that chisels away at your bigness and brings with it large and small humiliations that stir the depths of shame. 
with sons and daughters bearing witness to what was once a man. I heard the cry of the ancestors through your fists and gritted teeth. Fight and perish, cower and survive. Daddy, I hear your plea. There is no place for vulnerability in this world for you or for me. How I wish we could have looked at each other with kindly eyes, that we could have shared a moment without fear, that we could have been vulnerable together, like I know now it's possible to be. Daddy, you followed the ancestral call and for that I am grateful. Willingly I step forward with my personal sacrifice in hand to bring words to the wordless and feeling to the hurt. I'd want to stop there. That's very moving, uh. Eugene. And, you know, in addressing the shame and fear perpetrated ancestrally, you can feel the, the healing that's going on because of your ability to do that, which I'm sure you've done a lot of work on that area to come to this place where you can name it and feel the compassion from within yourself and forgiveness that's needed really for you to grow and heal through that, this situation. May the ancestors be honored in this process. Thank you. No, thank you, Eugene. I think what you really touched on there for me was um, just the anger of, <clears throat> that I think a lot of black men experience um, due to the situations that they find themselves in and, um, and then how that's transferred you know, intergenerationally um, is very powerful. And well done for uh, being a man who is able to be vulnerable despite that history. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Aisha. It's, um, it's strange saying the poem here, um, but also it feels, I feel fine with it. Um, actually, I, I, my body would have crumbled years ago. I would have just, my body would have just crumbled. That would have been it. But uh, so I feel, it feels, it feels fine to, to say, and it just feels really honest to give both sides um, of my experience with him. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot, uh, quite a few um, messages coming through in the chat and the Q&A um, that maybe we can attend to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and lots of moving responses to your presentation in particular, Eugene. Um, yeah. Powerful stories by Dennis and Eugene, very helpful. Voices of self and others listening and speaking internally. Thank you for sharing your pain and healing, Eugene. It was moving. Twisted and beautiful all at once. So we could perhaps look at the q and I think. Mm -hmm. See what people want to know in there. Well, there is a separate button here um, yes. for questions. Um, So this one here, um, how as therapists can we work with that impact of non-expression of grief to allow our clients some healing and not just therapists, I guess, just with our families and our friends too, yeah. Mm -hmm. How can we work on the, of the impact of non-expression of grief, yeah. You want to answer that, Eugene? 
I can say something. Um, I'm offering you the chance. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose I suppose to give people time. Um, I suppose that my own experience is is of that. Um, and um, what to, what can I say? I mean, there's something about attending to the body, I think, and just being, finding the way to be embodied somehow, finding the way to be in the body. So it's like sometimes we can get into our heads and try to sort of justify or try to work it through or try to say things to ourselves. And um, sometimes just you know, locating where, where the feelings are in the body can just allow something to be released. Um, but of course, then you'll need people around you who can hold can hold that grief and are accepting of it and take it in. So finding the right people um, is important as well. Um, yeah. I mean, in terms of dealing with the grief that's going on in my family right now, I think one of the messages that has come across quite strongly from all corners of the family really is not to be silent about this and to keep on talking to each other about the impact of this loss, especially during this time. Um, and just acknowledging that <clears throat> it's not something that we are expecting ourselves to get over in two weeks, as the kind of culture in this country is expected you to do. Um, and that we can express our grief, that it's okay for us to express our grief in any way that we think is right. Um, and not to uh, kind of go around with this British stiff upper lip uh, as if nothing's happened. Um, I think it's been very important to us as a family to keep on the conversation and to hold his, to hold his memory. Um, yeah. And, and also um, what might appear to be a non-expression of grief is an expression of grief. And so it's important not to, you know, speculate that this person is not grieving because they shut down in some way. We know that historically, many of us have been shut down um, because of our histories, because of colonization, slavery, et cetera. And um, as therapists, this, this, this question came from a therapist. As therapists, it's really important that we um, do our own healing in that area that we make a decision to work on our own shutdownness around grieving and all of us have it in different variations um, and also that we because we have knowledge and wisdom um, and we know what's happened to our communities intergenerationally and interculturally including the assimilation processes of being in Europe um, because we know that we know that as Dennis said, we are holding that somehow and we can experience naturally and intuitively what we know our bodies are saying to us, as Eugene suggested. We can just find a way to overcome any fears of feeling this is something that we can't do as therapists so that we can, in a way, model for the clients that we're working with. And I always say in, in, to supervisees that um, we are holding that element that's not being spoken until the client is ready to reveal how they feel about, how they really feel about not being able to express for a start on top of what it is that they're actually not expressing. So there's, an, there's two layers there, multiple layers in fact cultural layers, intergenerational layers, and so on. Mm. Of course, there's rage as well, somewhere possibly there too. That's yes. also in the mix. It's not you know, normally just one feeling. And um, it's, it's often a suppression of all types of feeling <laughs> and rather than just one in particular. Um, okay, I've got another... Um, Oh, well, okay, we've got another question here. Um, many of us are dealing with issues of personal grief 
how do we heal from the grief that we all experienced so publicly with the death of George Floyd so brutally exposed? So that sort of connections that we feel to him and to others who've been brutalized by police, how do we work with, how do we, yeah, uh, how do we heal from that? But again, I, I feel that it's not healthy for us to shut down on it. Mind you, there are times when I felt like withdrawing from the battle uh, because that public lynching of George Floyd opened up a mine, a, 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 what did I say, a mine of explosion around the racism that many of us have experienced. And it's collective, even though sometimes we may feel alone in our grief. From that day on, I remember crying every day for at least a month, crying at many things, but, <clears throat> but also just noticing that crying is healthy. And crying is healthy, crying is a way of healing. So I think sharing our collective grief and also not being alone in it too much is quite important because from our own homes, we saw it, even though it happened thousands of miles away. And it opened, as I said, a mine. And, and then it was Black Lives Matter. And so what's come out of that is that we're having this. We're having these meetings. We're addressing these issues. We're sharing some of the grief and the um, experiences of healing. And no matter how difficult and painful it is, that's also part of the healing. Once we start to share it, that's part of the healing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you and you remind me, Aisha, that uh, one of my dearest friends who I've been friends with for what must be 25 years, 30 years, um, for the first time, the two of us broke down in tears um, and were incredibly vulnerable with each other in a way that we've never been before. I mean, unlike a lot of people, I'd refuse to watch um, the lynching, as you quite rightly put it, Aisha, of um, George Floyd. Um, uh, yeah, because I think it just adds to, you know, the trauma that I've already experienced in terms of witnessing black death uh, on our TV screens and mobile screens. Um, and I've decided not to subject myself to that anymore. Um, and that doesn't mean that it didn't have a huge impact on me, especially in terms of feelings of rage and anger. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I think the HIV epidemic kind of hid for me or highlighted for me was just the, the level of anger that I felt, but I misdirected that anger. I thought it was about homophobia and racism and not actually recognizing that I wasn't dealing with the anger in relationship to the high level of grief that I experienced. And it wasn't until I went into therapy that I discovered that. So yeah, um, it's no surprise to me that there were demonstrations around the world today. Uh, it's just part of that grieving process, I think, anger. Mm. That isn't often acknowledged or talked about. Yeah, and I think the way that I have, I mean, I, I had a period of being numb for weeks and weeks and weeks of uh, shutting down. I guess that's just my style, when the initial thing that happens to me. And I have to work to kind of come out of that, and be connected. And it's really, really been through the, uh, through, through, through the gatherings that we've had, uh, we, we've met up um, with people, connected with people. Um, I think the tendency is to me to just not engage and not and just sort of see if I can do it on my own and and hide away and hopefully it will go away. Uh, and it's difficult being in the in the spaces where people were angry, uh, grieving. Um, but that's where I needed to be. 
uh, and that's actually healed me to, to a degree. And that's really important for me to just to connect with people um, and just keep connecting, keep connecting, keep connecting. A lot of people were strangers I was connecting with. <laughs> it didn't really matter. We're all black. We're all in the same. We all feel it. We all feel that connection. Um, and then some, somehow through our bodies, we transmit something to each other. And it, it, was, it sort of, I could just feel myself uh, coming back to myself. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to add that the ways in which we grieve are personal and collective and also intergenerational and intercultural and the ways in which we cope with grief are the same they're based on how we've learned to cope with loss and other situations from our past from our origins and this is even though it feels abnormal and excruciating sometimes um these are normal responses to ab an abnormal situation and the levels and the capacity of uh, grief and loss that we've experienced just over the COVID period is just humongous. And uh, one thing I want to say is that it's really important not to beat ourselves up because we're feeling that level of pain. And this too shall pass as Eugene reminded us, but sometimes it takes longer than we think it will. And we don't know how long it will take, but the important thing is to not to do it alone. Because often there's a pull to isolate and the shame around expressing our pain makes us isolate. That's the wrong way to go. It's really important to share, find someone to share with, a friend, someone you trust, um, get a therapist if you can't find someone close who you feel you can trust with those raw emotions and trust me you will find someone if you seek hard enough sometimes hopelessness sets in and you know oh there's no one that wants to listen to me and we feel bad but there will always be someone there somewhere Traditionally, that's how our families and descendants have worked. Someone in the village will be there for us. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Aisha. That's a good, really good way to end. Uh, I think our time is up. And um, thank you for the questions. And um, it's been a pleasure to present some of this stuff to you. I'm going to hand you over to Yancy now, I think. Thank you very much, Eugene. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Dennis. <sighs> That's what I feel. That's what I feel. When Aisha started her introduction, she said a tribute to two people, one of which was Lennox Thomas. Lennox was my friend. Lennox was my mentor. Lennox was the person who guided my career, supported me through my research. Lennox was that black man granddad to my children. I miss him, I miss him. When I heard Lennox died, I was on the floor for five days. I grieved for Lennox more than I grieved for my own dad. When my dad passed, Lennox was the person who, he, he always said to me, whatever you're going through, Yancy, you get through this, write about it. When my dad died, he said, just, just write. And I remember when he died, I thought, you know what? What's he going to say? Just write. So I wrote and wrote and wrote. Um, yeah, I was going to read something I wrote for him, but I, I can't. Um, I miss Lennox. That's all I will say. Thank you so much for everyone, all the contributions. We've been through so many topics. There we spoke about personal grief. You spoke about distance, customs, rituals sexuality, physical health, that's not just COVID, racism, you know, intergenerational trauma, which is something that touches so many of us, but 
it's almost like the elephant in the room. We don't really address it. And therefore the difficulties around healing from it. Um, that issue of parental relationships and smacking, abuse, we've been there and we've normalized it, but we carry the burden of it. And when that parent dies, it's the grief that we deal with. Um, with the anger that went with the, as, as um, Dr. Aisha said, the lynching of George Floyd and the racism that we've experienced. Um, so many topics will cover there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, as emotional as it is, these conversations are needed in our community. We need to find spaces to have more of these conversations because they're so incredibly helpful. So, there you go. I'm back in the room. <laughs> um, Patrick Vernon, at the, the beginning of the COVID situation and, and all the deaths and the setting up of mainstream, he decided that he wanted to do something that was incredibly phenomenal. Patrick, we all rate you for doing it. And that is the set up the Majonzi Fund. Um, Patrick and Kashane, do you mind unmuting yourselves and talking us through the Majonzi Fund? I've got, um, I think Tracy's got some slides, but before I start, I just want to acknowledge the Barton leadership team, uh, Eugene, I, Aisha, and my brother, from another, another mother, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to acknowledge your powerful, really powerful, heartfelt stories. The reality of grief that we have to deal with, not just linked to a particular person's past, but ongoing grief that we have to deal with. And, and, and particularly Eugene, I can identify what you said about the whole stuff around fathers, it, that trauma that is passed on to us, how we have to deal with it. It's something that a lot of black men still have to deal with even today. So I just want to acknowledge that in particular. So um, before I, I go uh, talk about John's fund and, and I have my guest, uh, Shane's going to join talk about how he's going to be, how he's involved in John Defun, what's grief to him? Uh, as you know, this is National Grief Week. I'm actually wearing a T-shirt, if you can see. National Grief Week. And there's been a whole range of events, starting from Thursday. Uh, as Yancy said, we launched Bainstream. And that's just uh, we launched developing a range of support services uh, in the community for those who have mm -hmm. sort of lost connection with COVID-19. But um, the Good Grief Trust, which we, we are partnering with, have been uh, organised a whole range of events and activities. And so we thought it was important to use this opportunity to share experiences from, not just from the African Caribbean community, but also from the Southeast Asian other communities who have also experienced lots connected with COVID. But before we go straight into that, on a personal level, I've, I've, um, grief has been really big on me uh, over the last several months. I've, had, I've, I've lost so many people I'm, I've known so the first person I lost was actually this time last year, uh, and Barbara Campbell, who I knew, who I worked with for many years. She did Black History magazine. She died at the age of 61. She died of dementia, believe it or not, of dementia at 61. So she died, she died in December of last year. And then another close friend of mine um, in Hackney, where I live, uh, Andrew Anson, she was an activist, community activist, community organizer. Um, she died, um, um, uh, round, just before the lockdown, around about late February. And then Brother Dougie, you know, you probably might dub, who was an activist, community story, and he also died around about March time. But the biggest death um, that's had an impact on me is the loss of my brother-in-law, uh, Alex. He died uh, in April of this year, um, sort of linked with COVID, but other issues as well. And then in July of this year, uh, as you know, I've been heavily involved in the Windrush scandal. And a very close person I met along that journey, which I became part of her family, was Paulette Wilson. Um, she died in July this year. And really, the whole stuff around grief and the impact of grief that we all have to carry is immense. And, you know, seriously, I've, it's just been like a whirlwind of dealing with all these deaths of people I knew personally, as well as other people I knew in the community. But anyway, let's move on to the, what we're going to focus on today, um, John Z. Fun. Tracy, if you can do the honours, please. Thank you. So, uh, so National Grief Week, uh, and this is our contribution to that. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the Majonzi Fund. So the impact, 
this, this next slide, please, JC. Thank you. So, as we all know, I'm not going to rehearse this. We know what the impact of COVID 19 has been on Black and Muslim communities. We know there's over 60,000 plus deaths have taken place in the last several months. And we roughly know that maybe one in three or maybe one in four people of, from the Black and Asian minority communities have died of COVID-19. And we also know that it, it required a number of us from uh, senior clinicians in the NHS to campaigns activists and the public to put pressure on the government to acknowledge the significant disproportionality of deaths in the community. And that is still ongoing, as we know, as the vaccine's been rolled out as from this week. And uh, next, next slide, please, Tracy. And in response to that, in the absence of what was happening and, and in terms of how I lost my brother-in-law to COVID this year, all families from different communities, different faith groups were struggling, as you heard already just a while ago, how to say goodbye to your loved one how do you deal with grief? And that's why we established the Majority Fund, working close with Yibele, and I want to personally acknowledge um, Yvonne Field, who we worked together on the idea of launching this. So I want to, I want to she can't join us today, but I want to acknowledge Yvonne in particular, founder of Yibele, a fantastic individual and campaigner for the community. So we launched the fund on GoFundMe April this year. And the, and the main focus of the fund is about remembering of those who are lost to COVID-19. As you remember, during the time of the media coverage that took place during March, April, May, uh, when we saw every day Black and Asian staff, and also a lot of Filipino staff in particular, dropping like flies, dying, linked to COVID-19, working in NHS, working in retail, working in the public transportation systems, not being acknowledged properly basically. And I thought it was important that we do something like this. And that's why we launched the Majonzi Fund. Majonzi is a Swahili, Swahili word, meaning grief and deep sorrow. And that's what, and that's what we're all feeling, grief and deep sorrow. And was, so we felt it was important to do something around this. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the main objectives of the Majonzi Fund. Firstly, that we want, we recognise there is no national offer uh, uh, in terms of providing bereavement support for Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities in Britain. There's no national offer. Obviously, there are organisations that do this stuff, but there was no national offer. And that was further reflected in the research work that we did. And that led to the creation of BAMESTREAM, including the Barton, Nasfiat, the British Psychological Association, a number of campaigns, activists, BME voices, and close work, all working closely with the Ubele. We created mainstream as trying to develop a national offer or intervention around more counselling support. Um, we also recognise that a lot of stuff, a lot of us were losing our um, people due to COVID-19. And also there was no opportunity to say goodbye properly. And the idea was to launch a grant scheme so we could give out grants and we hope to do this from next year onwards so people could organise their own events or commission work or anything at all to recognise the loss of their loved ones from Black and Asian communities. And also we want to raise a profile around lobbying to acknowledge that about our loss. Because often when the media focus on stuff, I mean, the Hampson media have done some good jobs in terms of focusing them down on frontline staff, particularly Black and Asian staff who lost loved ones. But if you read the average media story, it's almost like our loss is insignificant, despite the fact we are overrepresented in the number of deaths met with COVID-19. So we've been working closely with a range of organisations such as CRUISE, the Child Bereavement Network, National Bereavement Alliance, the Good Grief Festival, the Good Grief Trust, and also we're members of the GLA Bereavement Network, and also uh, we are work, we work in partnership and support the work of the COVID-19 bereavement families for justice who are demanding a public inquiry. Uh, and also this is some of the work that Yubele has been doing in terms of the Yubele We Need Answers campaign to, to recognize that our loss has to be acknowledged properly by the government. It can't be swept under the carpet because we are people of color or because we're not, we don't, we don't value or recognize us. Uh, next slide, please. So I've mentioned, um, we've launched it. So Nasfia, one of our members, a part of BAMESTREAM, 
um, they are now uh, offering the service, a support service for those experiencing loss connected with COVID-19, either in terms of bereavement or just the impacts of social isolation law or the, or the impact of lockdown as well. Uh, next slide. And if you want to contact, um, you can go through the Beamston website and where you can actually register uh, for referral and they will deal with um, and support you as well. As also there's general information on the Bamestream website as well. So I do urge you, if you know anyone that needs that support as well. Next slide. And so we're launching a grant scheme in early spring, uh, and that will be all information will be on the Bajonzi website and the Ubele website. And the idea that we will give, we're going to be giving small grants to individuals, uh, to community groups, to faith groups who want to organise events connected with people who have died of COVID-19 to recognise their achievement, commemoration of their loss. And as we explore later on this, as part of this programme, there'll be lots of conversations about how people have had to manage this as well. But we, this is our contribution. Um, we've, and for the majority fund, which we launched a GoFundMe in April, we've raised about just under £85,000. Our target is to raise £100,000. So if you've got deep pockets this evening, please go on to GoFundMe or contact us directly if you want to make a contribution of any sort as well. All money will be appreciated unashamedly and they'll be grateful. Uh, but the whole thing will be launching a scheme in the new year so people can apply as well. And we'll try and make the, the process as easy as possible to support those who need it to do things that they need to do. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll have the information on the website um, in terms of how you can, uh, different examples as well. Next slide. So, and also we're gonna be launching a schools competition next year as well, because we recognize that the impact of COVID-19 has that also had the impact on young people, uh, not just simply um, them losing loved ones, like maybe the far, their parents, um, fam family members, or even siblings, but also it's had an impact on them in terms of how they see Britain, uh, and particularly uh, on how they see the future of Britain. And if you couple that with Black Lives Matter, then it's, it's like, what kind of Britain do we want to have? I'm not, not being too political, but also with Brexit as well. What sort of Britain do we want to have for young people? We want, so this is an opportunity for them to express and articulate that. Uh, so we'll, there'll be further details of that next year. Uh, next slide. So a lot of people have been fantastic in raising money for Monjonzi. Some people have been making um, PPE masks, uh, culturally sensitive PPE masks. Some people have done performances, some people have done yoga classes, some people have organised, made t-shirts, organised events. A lot of people have done little things. These little things, these small acts of kindness has helped us to raise money. Not as much as, as, as Major Tom, who's raised over 30 million pounds from NHS, but we're getting there. Uh, but, and I just want to acknowledge that. People have done walking stuff, all kinds of stuff. People have done to contribute to that, making cakes and all kinds of stuff in their little way to support the work as well. But I want to highlight three um, individuals who have really helped in a big way. Uh, next slide. So um, I want to acknowledge the London Gospel Community Choir, Henry Beaumont, Rios Phillips, and then you're going to hear from Kashen a little bit later. So next slide, please. So Rias Phillips, a young black man who launched a successful book a couple of years ago on uh, Caribbean takeaways and restaurants. Uh, when he heard that we were looking for money for the Majonzi Fund, off his own back, he approached a whole variety of chefs, black Asian chefs, uh, Mediterranean chefs, all around to say, can you contribute with recipes of your diaspora communities so we can make it into a diaspora recipe book so we can raise money for the Munjonzi Fund. And he launched this ebook, and he's raised just under, I think roughly about 30,000 pounds for us, um, where people can download the book and make a contribution. And I just want to say, big up Riaz, uh, in terms of a young man who has gone over and above to help us in this big way. So I just want to thank him very much. Uh, he's been interviewed quite a few times of his work, but I want to thank him personally for that. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to acknowledge London Gospel Community Choir. There's, you'll, you'll listen to the song a bit later on. But again, they heard the call from Majonzi and they have dedicated one of their songs where the royalties uh, for the first 18 months will go to the fund. Uh, and the song's fantastic, called Sun and the Rain, which is, uh, and obviously lot, everyone knows London, the Gospel Choir has been going for about over 30 years under the leadership of Basil Mead. So we salute you for your support. Uh, next slide, please. 
and also uh, Henny Bowman. She works for the Guardian newspaper. She is a freelance um, graphic um, artist. She does all the cartoons that you see in the Guardian. And she did a fantastic one acknowledging the Windrush victims. And then she she then she then tagged me into that and I contacted her and said, would you do one connected with um, those men and women from the Black and Asian community who've died on the front line uh, to help us raise money for Majonsi. And she'd done that. So this is what she's done. Um, we actually, she actually, we then made it into a, a complete billboard poster, which we unveiled um, in September with um, Deborah Wicks Bernard, who's a deputy mayor for um, at GLA, Great London Assembly, um, and also Carol um, Williams, who's a councillor, cabinet member in Hackney. And we launched it in Newington Green um, by, by the social club, and it's there, Pride and Joy. Uh, but also you can buy this poster at, from the Guardian website for £35. And, and, this, and she's, she's listed everyone from the Black and Asian community who have died of COVID-19, written down, as well as highlighted some of the key people that were quite prominent when they were featured in the media as well. And you'll recognise some of the names and recognise the faces as well. So, so, so I want to thank Henny for your support there. Uh, next slide. And I'll stop there because I now want to invite uh, Kishane David to join us, who will talk about his involvement with Monjonzi and his experiences of grief. If you can drop the slide, so thank you. So Kishane, um, welcome to this evening. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation, Patrick. So please, um, so just tell us a bit about your perspective of grief and and what's your contribution to supporting us. Sure, um, I'd like to do that uh, by, by sharing a slideshow with some pictures because it's often easier to uh, illustrate uh, what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to share, and hopefully you will um, be able to recognise the journey that I'm going to take you on. So. Cremanta Rum is supporting the Majonzi Fund. And this is a really important thing that we wanted to do something that was uh, important to our community, important to the, the rum business that we have established. And very specifically with our first rum, we wanted to do something to give back into our community where a lot of our stories and the inspiration is coming from. So if I can, just um, uh, my slideshow isn't moving. Here we go. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit um, about the Cremante Distillery and Blending House. Now, it's an independent black owned business creating rums which are inspired by stories and knowledge passed on over generations in African and Caribbean families. Why, why we were interested in supporting the Majonzi Fund. I mean, Patrick and I go back quite a way and we had a conversation nearly 10 years ago at the Rum Fest where I was working as a brand ambassador about rum and what the social significance of that was. So we wanted to support the uh, Majonzi Fund, uh, recognizing that COVID-19 has, has had a devastating impact on our black communities and it's disrupted a lot of our cultural practices as we've been hearing. It also has left us with a sense of unfinished business and wondering whether or not we've paid the loss, the recognition it, reserve, it deserves. Our usual practices, such as the Nine Nights from Jamaica, my own background, the big drum, ceremonies from Karakou, and you can see that rum has a particular place in recognizing the ancestors there. And more generally, in pouring libations that we see throughout, throughout the whole diaspora. So rum has often had a very particular place. My personal story that I'll share with you is that I know this pain, pain that we've been hearing earlier in the presentations. We lost our mother recently uh, under the first COVID restrictions and it left our family struggling with a lack of culturally familiar endings and arrangements. 
So as a family, I wanted to help my own family and I wanted to do something with the rum that I've been developing and I've been working on for quite some time. So I produced a, a limited edition rum for the memorial that we had as a family. It was socially distance, but at least there was some way that I wanted to provide something that was important to me that I could give and also recognize my mum's life. So it's a drink, it's a keepsake, but it's also more than that. It's also something that can help, that helped our family um, deal with a very difficult time. And I was blown away by the response of my family members by that. A few months later, my uncle Julian died and I offered the same thing to his family. And again, it was something that they really valued and recognized as something that was uh, a memorial to their father and something that they could keep. So how can you help? We've set up a GoFundMe fundraising page, Cremantorum supporting the Magenzi Fund. And if you donate £45 to the GoFundMe page, you'll receive a bottle of Cremanti rum, as well as making a donation to the Majonzi Fund. Cremanti rum will also then match your donation, so that we want to give back as much as we can into a very worthy cause. I'll leave my details there if anybody does want to um, follow up, but more importantly, go and donate. Majonzi is a great uh, it's a great cause, it's a great fund, and it really is very much about us and our way of actually recognising and remembering people. Thanks for that, uh, Christina. Thanks for your support. And please support and buy the rum, not just for drinking, but just for fundraising to help that. You can just pack it to one side, don't drink it but support, but it's a good rum anyway, because I'll be good, I'll be with my lot for my family for Christmas. Um, over to you, Yancy. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Kashin. I'm coming for my rum. I'm not a drinker, but I'm coming for my rum. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, we've got just over half an hour and we've got lots more exciting things to get through. So Dr. Rosemary, please, can you unmute yourself? Tell us who you are. And I have just one question that I want to ask, and it's in response to something um, Aisha commented about the fact that Black ministers aren't allowed the same opportunities to get the same amount of work within the funeral industry. Is that a fact? Um, I'm not, I can't really say for that. I think it depends at the moment. There are lots of different ministers um, who take on responsibilities for funerals. And so I've been online and seen and attended funerals um, with independent ministers, um, as well as funerals with uh, um, ministers from more uh, mainstream churches, black and uh, most, I'm talking about black ministers. So I can't really say, because what I can say is that, um, I mean, on Friday, I'll be um, going to take the funeral of a wonderful um, a gentleman who has sadly died and I'll be, I mean, he particularly asked for me, so I'll be going to take his funeral after I come off here, which I won't be able to stay for the rest of uh, all of this because I have to go to a, a nine nights by Zoom for a, a, a beloved grandmother um, who, who passed just before the age of 100. So um, yeah, so if death is around me at the moment. I, I think that there has, historically been a challenge um, for black ministers and um, sometimes funeral ministry. So, but I think also at the moment, quite honestly, uh, the way funeral directors are taking the responsibility for leading on who they get, they, they may go and get a tried and tested minister, uh, people that they've gone to that they, you know, understand and, and that can be a black person or a white person. I think that there might be, and I only say might be, perhaps more of a challenge for independent ministers, if they're not known to that, um, to that funeral house, then that could be a difficulty. And sometimes if your family um, is not from a mainstream tradition, but goes to an independent church, and then they go along to you know, the funeral directors and say, we'd like this minister, maybe there's a little bit of um, some 
uh, tension with that because they might want somebody that they know who will um, lead the service in a way that, you know, goes along with the, if it's a creme, the half hour service, you know, if it's in the chapel at the, at the, um, at, at the cemetery, you know, you only have these time slots and never mind the challenges that we have at the moment with numbers that can be present and the, the social distancing, you know, and all the other um, challenges. I, I wanted to say, cause I know there's lots of excellent speakers and I'm speaking from a Christian tradition. Um, and, I, and, I, and I know that we've got speakers from interfaith traditions who are waiting to speak. And I really want us to give them the place and space because they've been waiting to speak. So the only words that I, I felt, um, hadn't been mentioned and I wanted, um, I, I wanted to just bring into this is that um, the, the tradition um, that I think has really been um, lacking in this whole process of how we grieve in this very um, itemized way, you know, um, separated way is that we're not able to uh, lament and I, I just haven't heard that word. I, I know it's there in behind what people are saying, but we just haven't been able to, to, to keen in the way that people keen. We haven't been able to express openly the way that people um, um, uh, kind of bring, bring forth their, their grief. And, um, and that I think is, is one of the words. The other thing I think that the, the challenge of this, um, this loss of sense that we've had this separation, you know, we've heard the loss of touch, the loss of gathering, um, the loss of sound, of, of music, of singing, the loss of smell, of the senses that go around, and, 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 and particularly, you know, that loss of taste, because for many people, um, when we grieve as well, we celebrate, and when we celebrate, we eat and we drink, and that sense of that's missing so all our senses are being deprived and uh, at this point in time and I think what that's bringing for us is it's trauma so it's not just the the loss that's traumatic the lack of grieving and lamenting is traumatic and that is something that we're going to be people are going to be carrying with them and your responsibilities and, and ministers responsibilities is how we take time with people how we set time apart for them and how we offer them services and places and spaces where they can hold memorials and where they can come again in over a period of time to, 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 to mourn again, to grieve again, and to be able to fill back up their senses with that lamenting and all the ways in which we, we come together. And that will bring a sense of healing. And I think at the moment, you know, people who have lost and they haven't been able to come together, they are still broken. There's a lot of brokenness. Um, and I know from my own uncle who died and my cousin is still very broken by that death of five, five, six months ago because um, only 10 people were allowed at the funeral. So that sense of being able to connect with people, hold on to people and grieve and lament was not there. So, so, so really those words, I just wanted to add those in, was that sense of the loss of our senses, was the, 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 the trauma that will continue, the need to really uh, keen and lament and find that place for that, and the responsibility that, um, that ministers, pastors, priests, uh, counselors, psychoanalysts, the, the, the responsibility we have as we go forward to recognize that, that brokenness and the need to enable people to find a sense of healing through this process. I just want to say that and leave space for my other uh, colleagues to speak. Thank you so very much, Rosemary. Th thank you. That was, actually, I didn't actually think about the lamenting and the taste. So thank you for actually throwing that into the mix. Um, I'm going to ask Laura, Please, could you just, because I know it's a bit connected as you were talking about, Rosemary, about healing. I know Laura is one of those people who are there to help with that healing process. Laura, can you unmute, please? Yep, certainly. Um, <clears throat> okay. So yes, I'm Laura and I'm an consultant. So within that role, I perform duties of a deaf doula that means that I can provide support for my clients and their families 
on a social, emotional and spiritual level upon the approach to their death. Um, I've always been interested in death from a social perspective. Um, I remember when I was about seven, going to um, a family member's house and seeing this long box. And my dad said, you didn't meet um, cousin Headley. And he picked me up, swooped me off my feet and held me over lengthways cousin Headley's body. So I still remember Cousin Headley's face to this day. But um, as I was saying, it's always interested me from a social perspective. And I first embarked on the role of a doula in 2015, when I was able to help care for my aunt through the night um, in Guy's Hospital as she was dying. And since her passing, and that I've tended to, I found that there's a real need for greater support around how we do death and how we cope with death. Our understanding of it and how we communicate, especially with medical staff at that time. I've been fortunate enough to be able to attend hospital appointments and to be there as consultants are explaining to families that there's nothing more that can be done for their loved ones. And at times like this, I've been able to ask those questions that we can't always ask because the rug has just been pulled from underneath us. Um, so it's been about clarifying, you know, what's happening, what the next steps are, what the family needs to do so that everybody is on the same page. So, over time, I've realized that there are more personal ways that we can be dealing with dying, death and bereavement. And although we don't know when we're going to die, it really doesn't hurt to plan. Um, the more we plan and the more we share our wishes with others and normalize conversations around dying and death, and bereavement, the more our loved ones can feel more supported when that time comes and move forward knowing that they're doing the right thing with regards to the wishes of their family members. I'm also a funeral celebrant. I conduct funerals as well. So following on from what Sister Rosemary was saying with regards to um, you know, conducting funerals, especially during COVID-19, I was told recently that whereas there were a good 30 odd funerals a day, I was told that nobody from an African Caribbean perspective with regards to funeral celebrants were actually given a look in. Um, and it's true what Sister Rosemary says that um, at that time, funeral directors tend to go with people that they know. However, because we're not given that opportunity to show our ability, we are unknown. <laughs> so as a funeral celebrant, I liaise with the funeral directors and I create what I call celebrations of life that really honour the client and honour the families. Too many funerals where there's been such a disconnect between the person who is standing there and the person and the family that are the intended, you know, subject audience. What I have found is that by working through the doula role, I've been able to form a close relationship with the family and then conduct a, a celebration of life that just honours them on a more personal level. And um, I also provide bereavement support via counselling, via hypnotherapy and uh, through a listening service as well. So within my role, I just, I'm, I'm all for catering for the whole process as opposed to just one particular part and isolating the rest. It's about having a holistic approach um, as opposed to isolating because this is what we used to do. Originally, this was a community event, this was a social event, and everybody was involved in the process. It's 
completely foreign to our DNA. <laughs> and so we are forcing ourselves into situations now where we can't grieve openly, where we can't sing, where we can't come together, where we can't touch and hold. And these are our healing mechanisms. This is how we do. The West would benefit quite a lot from knowing how we do. And without, I'm going to wrap up soon, but I find myself in many counselling environments, uh, no, sorry, uh, courses. I find myself in very many courses, attending courses, where they're, where I am the only African Caribbean person in attendance. I'm used to it, but we are not represented. And so within those courses, when they're talking about people of, you know, when they're talking about culture, they're talking about Asian culture or, you know, European culture. Never are they talking about African culture. They may talk about Christians, but we are just lumped in, you know. So when it comes to our traditions and our beliefs and our ways, we are not acknowledged. And this is a really sad situation to be in. We are just not visible. And yet, we contribute so much. So as um, an end of life consultant, my intention really is to just raise awareness and educate. There is so much need for education around this situation where funeral directors are upselling to us because they know that we bury, they know that we spend our money we need to be taking back some of that control as far as I'm concerned and working within ourselves together as one. But I'm gonna leave it there, but thank you. Mm. Thank you very much for that, Laura. Uh, there's so much there that you have said. Um, and and uh, that doula, I mean, who knew? They, I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't know such a thing exists. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. You mentioned the fact that, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of the times there's a lack of focus and acknowledgement about the way of the ancestors. Yes. But we're very lucky in the space today. We've got Omelade, who I'm sure can share some light on that for us. So um, Omi, do you mind unmuting yourself, please? Tell us a little bit of who you are and give us a different perspective. Okay, greetings. Um, interesting, isn't it? We're talking about death and dying. And for me, one of the first things that we would do is to pour libation, to acknowledge the ancestors. So I want to do that verbally by acknowledging our ancestors who were buried in the soils of Africa and those who are scattered throughout the diaspora and those who perished in the Middle Passage. And um, I sit here, I'm, I'm really quite full. I don't have a title, but I think when Aisha was talking about um, somebody in the community that you go to. I suspect that is me. I'm a Grenadian and um, I'm also a Yoruba priest in that I can do naming ceremonies and um, funerals and marriages. And whilst I mostly now do naming ceremonies, I am also the person in the community that very often people call when somebody has died very suddenly. Um, and I am about the practice. I'm about the three nights and the nine nights and the 40 nights. I'm about the food that we would provide at three nights and nine nights and 40 nights. I'm about acknowledging ancestors on a daily basis. I'm really focused on what is important to enable people to come to peace with their grief. And whilst we keep talking about COVID, I would actually say that certainly my experience during this period is how COVID has triggered a lot of loss that people haven't dealt with. Even before COVID, there are those of us who were very reluctant to engage with or were conflicted when it came to religion and culture. So we might be Christians and we know that we have to go to the church and there's the Bible and all of that, but we also know that there is culture around death and dying. And what's important 
for me in working with individuals and families is finding out what will enable them to be at peace with what has happened. You know, my, I, I grew up with an old woman who would be called when people were dying at home. And the process of reconciliation in families, that was seen as very important because traditionally it's seen as beneficial that we resolve any conflict we have with people before they pass. It's important to the spirit that's passed and it's important to the family and friends that are around. Um, is it Kashane who talked about the nine nights in Jamaica? I think the, the one with the rum, am I getting that right? When he talked about Jamaica and nine nights. And uh, it's interesting, I, I was actually taken to Jamaica to help her family with um, the, the, the burial of uh, a loved one. And I was fascinated to find that in Jamaica, they have two different kinds of nine nights. They have the nine nights that we traditionally have, which is the ninth night, but they also call nine nights the night before the funeral. They have quite a shinding. Those are all rituals that we did to enable us to manage our grief. And what I suggest to people in terms, because of where we are, is that we try to do the best that we can with where we are. So the fact that we cannot gather after a funeral during these times to do the big feeding, because that is so important, but we can do a little feeding at home. The first thing that I do when I hear somebody has passed and I encourage people to do is light a candle, say their names and have a glass of water. Cook the food that you know they enjoyed because that is our connection. And that we continue to call their names because that's part of our culture and our tradition. It might not be religious, but it's what we're used to doing to enable us to manage. I think I've said enough. But thank you so much. Thank you. Very insightful. And I did not know in Jamaica there were two different types of nine nights. So I learned something new again. Every speaker has taught me something new. So thank you so very much for that. Um, now we have Maureen. Maureen, do you mind unmuting, introducing yourself and tell us your perspective of all of this. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about my experience of grief. Um, we, as a family, lost our two parents in the summer of this year. Um, related, unrelated to COVID, uh, the jury is still out on that. Um, what would I say? I was speaking with my sister when I spoke to her that I was going to find this panel. And I said, do you know something? If someone was to ask me, what date did mommy die? I would not be able to tell you without looking at the order of service. And the same would be for daddy. He's, he died three weeks later. He says, I don't know what date they actually died, despite being there. It's blocked out of my memory at this moment in time. And she said, that's a bit strange, isn't it? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe this is part of the grieving process. So the story is, mom and dad were both in a residential home. Uh, they did not share a room because at that point they um, you, and couples were not sharing rooms. We would see them, my sisters and, and brothers would see them regularly. We would have regular contact with them. And then they got ill. Dad was rushed to the hospital. Mum followed within a, within a few days. So they were in the same hospital um, having um, care. Dad with his diabetes and mum, unfortunately, had stopped eating and had stopped speaking. Mum had um, normal pressure hydrocephalus, so maybe on her brain there was impact. And we know with COVID, it attacks the most vulnerable parts of a person's immune system. So mum and dad were in the hospital for about three or four weeks. Fortunately, during the summer, we were able to get them discharged to our home and we nursed them in the living room, side by side, with hospital beds. We did our best for them. Mum never spoke again. She didn't speak for five weeks. 
up to her, her death. On the day before her discharge was when they told us that she was the end of life. We weren't expecting that. So COVID and the COVID legislation has actually robbed us more, more of um, our funeral rights than our services. It's robbed those people that are dying of that personal care, the contact with the health professionals. It's robbed that it's robbing people as we speak of connection. If you have a loved one, and I know for our community, letting our family members go into a nursing home is something that is quite alien. But for modern parents who are juggling children, grandchildren and careers, we actually no longer have the capacity to be caring for our loved ones at home traditionally. Our parents, particularly my dad, did not want to be in a nursing home. My mum understood the conflicting priorities that we had as, as their children. But mum went first and dad had to go after. They were married for 59 years. So how are we managing our grief? I'm not sure. I've shed a tear or two. I do a lot of writing. They're fully present in our lives, even in their death. They, it was very difficult because we weren't able to grieve for mum's mom's death because we still had to look after daddy the next morning. So the grieving is somewhere in the ether, waiting to pop out perhaps, or maybe it will just be buried alongside them and we will continue to suppress this grief. There's 10 siblings and we are all grieving in our own different ways. Uh, the majority of us went back to work within a few weeks. Uh, one sister particularly um, is not able to go back to work at the moment. And, you know, I'm a kind of like four-time grandma, so enjoying the, the fresh life of, of, of new babies. Um, what does grief mean to me? I don't know. My father and I spoke a lot about death. So it wasn't something that we would fear. We spoke extensively about life after as a Christian. He knew that he would be meeting his own father in heaven. And with that said, we spoke and we laughed and we joked. And I questioned him about if he was ready to meet his father. He was reassured that he had been a good father on earth. And just to end, uh, when my mother passed, and you know, it's, I think it's funny, we, because we didn't have any of our elders around us, even though we were all in our 50s, <laughs> we couldn't remember the things that they would have been doing. So we were singing really badly the, the church songs. We were, you know, trying to remember prayers. And, you know, we had a bit of Jim Reeves on in the background, all the things that mommy and daddy would have enjoyed. So we did it our way. You know, I anointed them with, with um, essential oils. I was rubbing mom and dad, mommy's arm up and down with oils and we, we all laid hands on them. We slept at their, on the floor in the living room with mum and dad for several nights whilst they were in the process of this slow death. Dad was alongside mummy when she died, but we were all in the living room um, listening to every breath, every laboured breath and waiting and reassuring her that we were all here and we were all letting her go. So... That's my story. Thank you for listening. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for sharing it, Maureen. Sending you a, a hug through the screen, but thank, thank you so you. much for sharing it. So much love. And the, the love you have for your parents, it's really come through. You know, I like when you said you're doing it their way, all the music, the gym reads, I could just imagine that. So thank you so much again for that powerful, powerful testimony. Um, we have... Um, Imam Irfan. So he's going to give us a different perspective now. And it's something that I know nothing about. I'll be quite honest with you. Um, uh, Imam, could you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, you? I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, where do I start? Um, first and foremost, uh, thank you, um, not only to, to the organizers, but um, all those who participated and shared their very, very 
uh, emotional uh, and human stories. Um, I was asked, I think, and um, please forgive me if this is wrong, as, uh, as you say there, um, Yancy, you wanted a different perspective. And, and actually, as we hear more and more stories of, of grief and, and, and loss, um, uh, you probably won't be surprised if I say, actually, it's not that different. One of the things that um, I, uh, as an imam who's been very keen, uh, you know, I hate this phrase, interfaith dialogue, uh, uh, more about kind of doing things together, interfaith action. Uh, and, and, and what comes out of all of my experiences, and certainly in this uh, pandemic, is, is that humanness. Um, I could share my own personal testimony of losing my father, two years ago um, and uh, this recent pandemic here um, as an imam, I'm gonna start off with something that Rosemary said, if I may, uh, and, and you know, we, we, we learned, um, I think three or four weeks later uh, into the kind of the May, June uh, time that, you know, one of the other symptoms of COVID was this loss of uh, uh, sense of smell. Uh, and, and I want to say thank you, Rosemary, you know, you, you did a fantastic uh, point there, made a fantastic point about actually how we've, we've lost the senses during this moment of grief. Um, as a, uh, somebody from an Asian sub background, um, I, uh, the most painful thing I think during supporting this whole kind of uh, loss era, era has been all of those losses. Uh, the sense of physical hugs and, and, and wiping tears and grabbing onto somebody, letting your heart just flow. Uh, and, and again, that word lament. In our tradition, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he instructed us actually not to lament in the sense of uh, wailing and beating and, and kind of, you know, uh, going overly kind of um, emotional about it. When he lost his own blessed son, Ibrahim, um, the companions noticed that he, he was crying. And um, he, um, they were shocked. They, they looked at him and said, well, hang on a minute. You, I thought you advised us and told us that it was not Islamic. It wasn't the right thing to do, to lament and to, to cry over somebody in, in grief. And he said, uh, no, this, what comes down naturally that you cannot control, you're not accountable for. But this, your tongue, and he, he touched his tongue, this is this that comes, that is, in, that is in between your jaws, that you're accountable for. So, you know, he showed people, uh, our prophet, he showed people how to grieve. One of the uh, very um, kind of, uh, I, I think, blessings that I, I have uh, as a believer is that we were able to make sense of these very difficult moments. I've been listening attentively to all of the testimonies of the people uh, presenting here this evening. Um, uh, and, and really, I find myself in awe of all of your work, in particular, this uh, the new fund that has been set up. And I wish you all the, all the best with that, the Majonzi Fund. Um, but the second thing I wanted to touch upon was these, uh, these nights. Um, uh, and, you know, again, maybe you will be surprised or not, but this is something that we've lost hugely in the Muslim community. In our tradition, the moment of uh, the moment of, of actual departure uh, from that moment three days later so you, this three nights that you mentioned that is very much also part and parcel of the Islamic culture and exactly the same thing it is all about eating together somebody said it so beautifully before sharing that food that you cook together and and again um, this is why I say that the perspective is not that different because Somebody mentioned earlier also that actually you cook the food of those of, 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 of the you cook the favorite food of that person who who you've just lost. So within our traditions, I think collectively we have this um, uh, uh, this commonality of of grieving. Um, lots have been said about you know from a kind of uh, uh, emotional and, and a, a psychological perspective about it, but um, I, I think from um, an Islamic perspective, all of what's been said um, in, 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 in synopsis is a beautiful, beautiful uh, verse of the Holy Quran, which uh, I know when I lost my beloved father, 
quite suddenly, um, you know, it, it was a phrase that comes under the tips, the, the lips of everybody. So as soon as you hear of a death, you know, your phone goes crazy with people sending you messages and telling, you know, saying this phrase. And the phrase is what? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. So amidst all of the uh, the emotion, amidst the, the sometimes the anger and the anguish, amidst the uh, the loss and the pain, comes this powerful and solid, uh, almost kind of philosophical statement from God Almighty, where He says, "Look, Lilla." We came from him. This life that you have was his and is his, and it, he's he simply, you know, it's simply been returned. Ilayhi raji'un. You've we've simply gone back to him, and that is a sentence which, um, when I'm doing my services again, the socially distant services of 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 uh, of the janaza of the funeral prayer. Uh, has been immensely difficult over these past weeks and, and other people have reflected upon that. Um, uh, and I can honestly say that um, despite the uh, uh, the really difficult times, despite that pain, despite that loss, um, you know, I always personally anyway, always tried to look at the, uh, the blessings that God has given us through this time. And this screen that I've got here in front of me, I've done lots of uh, the equivalent of the, the 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 nine days, the nine nights that some you mentioned, Kashane, I think mentioned as well. Um, we have the third, and also then the fortieth day. The fortieth is is um, uh, is another important point uh, point of that grieving process, where you know it's kind of a few days have passed, a month or so has passed, and uh, uh, the grieving process, specifically for the household, the Prophet has said that actually you shouldn't prolong that because again, goes back to that point about this was all his doing and you should be, uh, you should be contented his doing. Finding your contentment in his will, as difficult as it is, is, is something that we're encouraged to do as, as Muslims. So the 40th is if almost a, a, a more or so a, a watershed moment where you've, um, you know, you've lamented, you've grieved, you've, 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 you've cried, you've, uh, uh, you've prayed, you've done all of those things collectively, and now it's kind of, you know, uh, almost go back to your normal life. But of course, as others have said, that loss never ever actually disappears. I saw a, a, a clip the other way the other day, actually, somebody explaining this grief that it actually it doesn't get smaller, it doesn't reduce. You know, this thing about time is a great healing. It's, of course, it is, but it doesn't mean to say that the grief is any lot in any in any less. The grief and the amount of grief and the suffering, the pain is always there. It's in fact, it's, you know, it, it perhaps grows. And what we learn to do as human beings is the rest of our life continues and, and, and kind of grows around it. So really, that's all I wanted to, to, to share is that we have far more commonalities than perhaps uh, certainly I realized before this evening. And I want to say once again, thank you to, uh, to Patrick for organizing that uh, great Majonzi Fund uh, and hope and pray and my prayers are with all of you, especially those who've lost personally people through this difficult time. I've had to, I've, I've been lucky in the sense that I've not lost anyone personally through COVID. I've had to support many people through the loss of COVID as an imam here locally in my town of Rochdale and Greater Manchester. Um, and and, it, and I, f I feel almost uh, kind of privileged, but the pain that was there uh, of being cheated, I think I'm going to have to say that word if we're going to be very frank with each other. The pain of being cheated for not being able to 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 do what is required of us as fellow uh, fellow believers, as fellow people of faith uh, for the community. That that sense of loss, I don't think I'll ever overcome. So I want you to uh, pray for me and to pray for all of the communities that lost uh, their loved ones you this difficult time. God bless you all. Thank you so very much, Iman. Um, 
that, that was very moving. It's fascinating to see the commonalities. And had you not come here today, I would not have even realized there were so many commonalities. Something you said actually um, made me remember when I was going through my own grief, when I lost my dad, a friend said to me like, grief was like a cut that sometimes scar tissue forms over it and it's okay, but there are times when it gets picked and it really hurts. And something you said just made that come right back to me. So thank you again so very much. There's so much we have in common across cultures we don't even understand. Thank you. Empress Lee. So Empress Lee has been a great support of all the work we've been doing. On a Friday, she's always there supporting us with our You Give Hope. So we set up You Give Hope as a form of Friday evening entertainment for people who have been troubled during the, um, the first stage of the pandemic. pandemic. I know time is going, but I'll just give you a quick history of it. There was one particular day when three people had contacted me who they were all suicidal. In that one particular day, there were three men. And I couldn't think of how, how could I support these three men? And if it's three of them in one day, what's happening to others in the community? So I phoned another friend and I was saying, explaining to him what was happening. And he was saying, we need to do something to help lift the spirits of people in the community. And we decided we would have a Friday evening gig. We got some musicians to come and some DJs to come. And that was in May. And from then to now, every Friday evening, we've been putting on this gig. Just artists come and perform. And Presley is one of those who has been coming. She will tell her own reason why she's been into the space. And Presley? Hi, yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um... Yeah, thanks guys for inviting me to come and speak. Um, how can I describe how I'm feeling right now? Um, I am bursting at the seams. I am so full. I feel that I've eaten, eaten dinner for like 10 people. Um, there's so much to absorb. Um, right, yeah, my mother, um, she passed away on the 27th of um, April. And just like Maureen said, I actually had to look in the calendar to see the date that my mum passed away because I couldn't remember. Um, but um, at the time when she passed, um, we we hadn't been able to see her for some time due to the um, the word that I refused to um, call because it's getting too much airplay as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it's responsible for the way I'm feeling. So, um, yeah, we weren't able to see her for a while. Um, how I feel then, I f the feelings that I've got, I felt glad in a sense, because um, before she actually passed away in a in a nursing home, um, I was looking after her for uh, just a, about two and a half years um, prior to her going into the nursing home. So I'm kind of glad that I was able to do that and to help her. Because as um, somebody else, I can't remember who it was said that, um, you know, in our culture, being in a home is is not the done thing at all. Um, and um, my mum was quite adamant, even though when I was looking after her, you know, don't put me in a home, but she needed so much complex medical um, assistance that I was unable to give her. And obviously I'm not a medical person. Um, so um, unfortunately I had to put her in the home. And um, yeah, I was happy I was able to do that for her. Um, she luckily she um had a she had a stroke and which caused her uh, death um she died about uh, a week or so after she had um a second stroke um i feel angry i feel sorry i feel robbed these are all the words that comes to mind when i think back um to my mom's funeral robbed because i i mean we have quite elaborate send off for our for our loved ones and that was totally non-existent um um and somebody in the chat i saw somebody put in the chat that um and i thought i was going crazy when i had this thought i was saying is my mom actually in that casket um yeah we went to see her in the funeral home and yeah she, you could see her because you know they were expecting us to come but um we weren't able to you know have a last view of her before um 
she was later asked and is she really in there um and i just thought i was crazy for thinking that but obviously other people have the same kind of thoughts um and because we're not able to do our traditional um viewing etc um a funeral is supposed to be a celebration of life um i wasn't able to celebrate my mother and it's almost she as if she didn't even live for me personally um I don't know, I don't really talk about this. I mean, this is like the first time I've actually spoken about my mum's death and I see it as a kind of weakness. Um, not speaking about it kind of made me feel like I was strong because I didn't have to kind of deal with it or, you know, have to face the reality. But um, yeah, it's um, it's it's really difficult. Um, I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to end. But I'm I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that can kind of relate um, to the feelings that I'm feeling. And I, I, I know I'm not crazy. I know I'm not the only one. But um, yeah, I mean, thanks to the U Belly, you know, that I can come on on a Friday, listen to some music, dance, enjoy. Um, and things like that. And I think it's quite important um, not to kind of lock yourself away because, you know, you do find strength in being amongst other people, you know. So, I mean, I have buried myself. Um, I'm a, like, I'm a, a, a producer and a, a manager for um, a musician and I have so buried myself I'm on Zoom 24 seven and I've totally buried myself into my music so that I can just not have to think about the fact that mum's gone. Um, Cause when I, I compare it to my father, my father passed 13 years ago on the 22nd of December. So it's gonna be his anniversary in a couple of weeks. And it was just so, I didn't feel like this at all for my dad. I was, I wouldn't say happy is the right word, but I was in a better space. We celebrated his life and it's like his life did matter, you know, cause we're able to celebrate in that way. Um, and it was just such, um, it's like from one extreme to the other when it came to the non-celebration of mom's life. But yes, and um, it, I'm so glad um, you guys invited me on here so that I can for the very first time actually speak about the death of my my mother um but yeah thank you so much guys and um yeah thank you I'll thank you so that. very much and thank you for choosing this platform to, to talk about it and you know there are people here who you can speak to at any time and we look forward to seeing you as always every friday you're <laughs> always there thank you so very much i know that we are out of time but please we just we just have a couple more artists to go through and then Patrick will um, do the memorial wall and I will wrap up. So we Stuart is someone who for the first time this Friday gone was part of our You Give Hope Friday Evening Entertainment and he read a very powerful poem which I am sure he's going to share with us now. Stuart could you unmute please? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your really heartening, very human and very emotional sharings. I'm feeling very, uh, very connected. So I'm going to start by uh, reading a poem, which is called A Farewell Letter to Mum. Uh, my mum died unexpectedly on the 25th of June this summer and uh, we were still having to deal with the restrictions of lockdown by the time of her funeral in July. So I'm going to read the poem first and then I'm going to share a few reflections about some of the challenges and some of the dynamics that have arisen since her passing. Farewell letter for mum. 
a tiger mother through and through was our dear mum, our family's heart. Fiercely protective of your cubs towards any threat, a constant warder. I cherish that we grew up knowing we were safe from those of ill will. We were truly blessed to know robust loyalty lived by you and dad. Friends and neighbors too were the beneficiaries of this precious gift. 57 years, a record to be proud of. We celebrate you. Alert and steadfast, you showed us a quiet grace. Thanks for this vision. I am grateful, proud, as your son inheriting such a vest for life. Infinite is my hungry curiosity, thanks to your deep love. Laura, Heather, me, we have each blossomed in life, thanks to you and dad. Your sacrifices were many, your love constant, generous always. Your heart's compassion never left, never left you, always there, a warm oasis. Your welcoming ways said yes to so many people over the years. As a teen, my friends marveled at your dynamic openness to them. Your laughter raucous, your anger a summer storm, quick, intense, then gone. Your sense of justice, unerring, true and constant, in our DNA too. Creativity, yours really knew no bounds. We share that too. Your canvas was our home and each one of us kids, and of course our dad. Our garden a jewel, lovingly crafted and kept, your and dad's domain. My love of nature, yes, it endures and deepens, thanks to you and dad. Innumerable moorland and seaside journeys throughout our childhood, the root of this prize, Weekends out through all seasons, traipsing here and there. I remember well your endless knitting projects, complex creations. I tried to convince you that money was in it. You said, love only. Countless are the times you bailed me out of trouble. I'm ever grateful. Yes, yes, it's true too that you are my champion, never flagging. Many worlds I've known, my passport stamped with your love, the constant visa. I miss you right now, your energetic bustle, your yes you can ways. It was a delight to learn you swam like a fish, a joy we both share. I'm gladdened, though, that you have found your own peace and that it was swift. Your life was so full. Your warmth touched many folk. We are so grateful. You were the real deal. Litmus of honesty, sought out by many. Rest now, dear mother. You inspired such deep courage through your loving ways. Be assured your gifts shine bright in Amelia, Freya, Jamal, and Merlin. All my love, Stuart. Thank you very much, Stuart. What a lovely, lovely, moving poem feel as almost as I know your mom through it. You know, you've actually shared her with us. So thank you so very much for that. And I'm going to see you on Very Friday, welcome. I hope. Yes, yes. Thank you. So um, I wanted to, uh, to share three brief reflections in relation to 
my mum having passed this summer. The first of them is that it was a total surprise. The last time I saw her was on the 15th of December in 2019 when I visited her and my dad in Devon. And we all already knew that she was unwell. Uh, for the last 10 years of her life, she'd lived with a condition called constructive obstruct. Let me get this right. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which is a disease common to people who have smoked for maybe 55 of her 79 years, she was a very enthusiastic smoker, uh, very committed to the cause. And this is what brought on the COPD. So the last 10 years of her life, uh, our dad was her carer. She wasn't infirm, but she was reduced in the kind of activities that she could undertake. But right to the last, literally to the last weeks of her life, she was in her garden avidly doing what loving gardeners do. So when I learned from one of my sisters that mum had died on the 25th of June, it was a shock. But one of the things that happened as a consequence of mum dying is that whereas my two sisters and I had been estranged for four years and two years respectively, we came together in an instant to go and support our dad who's 84 and survives mum to take care of all the necessary business that's required when somebody dies and everybody here will appreciate what that business entails the second thing i wanted to share is that something happened between my dad and i during the time i was in devon for the funeral which happened in july it was something that I thought was an insignificant exchange between us. But the upshot of that exchange is that since the 16th of July, which was the day after my own 57th birthday, my dad and I haven't spoken. He has said he no longer recognizes me as his son. I don't know if that will always be the case, but for now, that is the case. The third thing I wanted to share, when we talked earlier, or when earlier speakers talked about ceremony and rituals and healing, is that I committed to journaling, to writing day pages for 30 consecutive days after I got back from Devon from my mother's funeral in July. And it was a beautiful process. It was a challenging process. It was a delightful process. And through it, I was able to reflect on all of the feelings that were present in regards to my mum, who I loved dearly. But as any of you who've been around a wild tiger knows, they're pretty big, scary beasts. So it wasn't all rainbows, but it was a really wonderful process. And I really couldn't recommend strongly enough to anybody else going through this process to just try it. It's a real balm. It doesn't take anything away, but it really helps give you perspective and a sense of space. The final thing I want to share as a reflection is that on Christmas Day, um, it will mark six months since mum's death. And uh, this year, of course, will be a remarkable year because for the first time in my own 57 years, mum won't be around. But as I wrote in the piece, in the poem, somehow I'm heartened that none of us knew that the day she died was going to be the day she died. So, yeah, there, there are some reflections, so thank you. Thank you again, Stuart, thank you so very much. Now, Alexander the Great, Alexander is also another one of our 
You Give Hope supporters on a Friday evening. And Alexander did an, a special tribute for us. He played it Thursday when we had the launch. It, it, it was just, I would just shut up and let you listen and be the judge of how touching it is. Thank you. Um, I know we've got the very little time. Just want to say the song is going to be one week old on Tuesday. It was written especially for Thursday's event. Uh, and after the wonderful example and the information we had from Patrick, I think we should make this song, I'm going to record, I'm in the process of recording it, make it available as a download to add to the Majonzi Fund. So we'll do that in the course of the next week, definitely. I shall be talking, uh, well, to whoever. Let's just go for it. It's called Sometimes. It's so hard to grieve in isolation When the climb before us looks immense Whether partner, close friend or relation Loneliness can feel much more intense as more of a struggle with bereavement We can't let this virus get control Oh no, take time off to cherish our achievements Letting precious memories fill your soul Christmas, Pesach, Ramadan Help is there for us before we shatter Whether we are child, woman or man Suffering in silence can't resolve it Locking up the pain groups are there who may help us solve it. Reaching out is what we need to do. Sometimes we hurt so Sometimes we may think our heart is healing 
other times we're sure it's going to crack no one else can know just how we're feeling are we moving on or sliding back grief is like a basket full of sadness filled with stories of a loving past oh yes telling them again can bring us gladness and ensure our memories will last sometimes we hurt so much sometimes we feel their touch sometimes scream sometimes we're in a dream sometimes we rise above sometimes we just feel love sometimes Thank you, Alexander. Thank As you. always, wonderful performer. Thank you so very much. My great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Jagby had to leave early, but she's left a few words with Patrick Vernon. He will just um, tell us, give us her message, and then he will introduce the memory wall. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Dr. Uh, Jagby, Dr. Johal couldn't make it. Um, she, she, she had to go to another call. Uh, but I've got something to read from her, that, so if you can just bear with me. Uh, and she's talking about grief in terms of the Sikh community uh, here in the UK. Uh, although grief and bereavement experiences involve some universal factors, it's also a highly personal process, often shaped by religious and cultural practices. Uh, understanding of different religious and cultural beliefs of individuals who belong to minority religions, such as Sikhism, may shed some light on the role of religion, culture, family, how food plays as a coping mechanism for the bereavement experience. All of which have been affected and curtailed by the pandemic. You cannot mourn with the family members, ceremonies are limited and also has effect and impact on the grieving process. Many ill Sikhs when dying listen to religious music called Katan and recite the path or prayer during their final moments, or their family members would do so on their behalf, and also choose to spend their final times with their loved ones. For many in the Sikh community who have died in hospitals of COVID during the first lockdown, this was not facilitated, and they did not have the loved ones by their side. Even in the last lockdown, families were only invited at the very end. Preparing of the body for cremation and viewing of the body has been affected, which makes saying goodbye difficult. After the cremation, the ashes are collected and released in a moving body of water, symbolising the body's return to earth and the soul's return to God. Many would go back to India or, or even do it here in the UK, but the current climate has been difficult for families. Uh, that was from uh, Dr. Jabir Jutta Jal, articulating very similar again to the similarities between the Muslim community and the, um, and, and the faith and practices within the African Caribbean community. Very similar and in many ways the commonalities that we all share around grieving. Um, that kind of brings me on to um, the final bit I want to talk about the majority fund. Uh, Tracy, if you can just uh, bring up the final slides, please. So uh, on, the, on the majority website, um, uh, we have launched a, a memorial wall. And I know that there are other memorial walls 
um, like St. St. Paul's Cathedral has a, has a, a sign in book and other uh, organisations have done that, but we've done one also. And we want to use this war uh, for a number of purposes. Firstly, for anyone who's lost a family member connected with COVID-19 from different diverse range of Black and Asian communities, they can express their uh, message on there for themselves, for their family or for the wider community. And also when we start the grant process um, next year, we want to encourage if people have organised events, activities or whatever ceremonies to choose this wall to share that. Because one of the key things is that unfortunately one of the consequences of the pandemic, and I have to use the R word, I'm sorry, on the, on the Sunday evening, racism and discrimination, um, is actually we're not allowed to grieve in the way that we're allowed to grieve. Uh, and also we don't have the, we're not given the platforms for that grief. So this is a platform for all of us in the communities to use this as a space to share our grief, but also to share the joys and to commemorate those who have passed on. I think it's really important. It's all part of all our traditions, all parts, all parts of our faiths to do that. And also we are keen for anyone who've got poems, blogs, or anything at all that they want to share about their loved ones. We want to use this, this website to share that information also as well. So th that's a link to the website as well. If we could go on to the next slide, please, um, Tracy. Also, I want to thank people who have helped support the development of the Majority Fund. Uh, firstly, the new Bele family, and it is a big family and a growing family. Uh, um, and also I want to thank Tracy, who is part of, who's done all the kind of technical things behind the scenes around the Zoom call uh, this evening, as well as on Thursday as well. Uh, but I particularly want to uh, acknowledge uh, Yvonne Field, the director and the founder of Yubele. Uh, the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, which I'm a fellow of, they gave me funding for the development of the Majority website. So I want to thank the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust for their support. I want to thank uh, Sassy Londes, who has designed the website uh, um, as, and also she will be updating all the information as uh, regarding all the work. So thank you, Sashi. Uh, I also want to thank Penland Doka. If, if you go to the website, there are a number of graphic illustrations and images reflecting the diversity of grief across all different faith communities. So I want to thank um, Pen, uh, who's done that, and also her colleague, uh, I don't know if I could get a name right, um, who's... Uh, Sikona Kimashan, who didn't, who's done that image that you just saw of the memorial rural. We're trying to reflect the diversity of grief of the, and how it has impacted different communities as well. And also I want to thank everyone who has financially made a donation, no, no matter how big or small, to the Majority Fund and everyone and all the fundraisers who have contributed, such as um, London Gospel Community Choir, um, Hanny Belmont from The Guardian and The Guardian team. Rios Phillips and also the um, Kashane with the rum, please buy. And thank you very much, uh, Alexander the Great. You've, I've known you for many years. You've done, you are the official clip sonning for Britain. If you've not been told that already, I will tell you that. And, it's, and thanks for your offer again for helping us as well. And if anyone's got any fundraising ideas, please contact me or use the Ubele team. We're happy to listen uh, and help, help in any way. So that leads me just to pass the baton back on to. Yancy, who's been a fantastic host as always. Yancy. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you so very much. Yes, please do send us any fundraising ideas you may have, because as you know, the idea is that the money supports those in the community. Um, if you want, you can email us at info at mainstream.org.uk. I've put it in the chat. Um, someone said in the chat that what a blessing the event is. Someone else said this has been incredible. It really has. I'll tell you what, two minutes before I logged on, I got a message, a call to say my 30 year old nephew had had a heart attack. So I sank and I thought, how am I going to do this? How am I, can I get through this? I did. How did I do it? by listening to the stories of everyone else and realizing I'm not alone in what I'm going through. There's so many people out there that are going through exactly what I'm going through. And that was comforting. Thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon, evening with us. Um, we need more of this. So any ideas on how we can do more of this, 
um, if you're willing to facilitate this happening somewhere else, please let us know at Bamestream. Thank you so very much. Have a good evening. Keep safe and keep healthy and support us in any which way you can. And thank you again, Yancy, for being a host. I didn't realise that the news that you just shared. You were fantastic as always. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you again, Tracy, who's been Tracy, can you reveal yourself, please? One second. <laughs> you don't have to. I mean, if you've got your colours on, I understand, you know. No, no. Hey. Hey. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> You're welcome. Are we playing the London the Gospel Community Choir? Go no, that's going to be it now, yeah. Yeah, we've gone 37 minutes over time, so thank you each and Oh, okay, sorry. It's on, the, it's on the Majonzi website, so you can, you can listen to it at your own time, you can raise some money, you can pay through the uh, iTunes and all that stuff, to, um, and all the, again, all the royalties will come to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone.